Hello. I'd like to start by thanking the workshop organizers for the opportunity to participate, and I'd also like to thank my collaborator, Tosh McBean. This talk is going to be about uh, opportunities to improve our skill at measuring and modeling plant drought responses, uh, focused specifically on knowledge gaps that can be confronted with better information about water potential gradients in soils and plants. Before I get there, uh, keeping with the theme of the workshop, I do want to acknowledge that in many ways drought stress can be viewed as a pulse stress. Um, we tend to think of drought as something that evolves and resolves, though of course it can wreak an awful lot of ecological havoc along the way, particularly in forests, where it can lead to sudden and unexpected tree mortality. On the other hand, we can view drought stress as a press. Um, globally, temperatures are rising slowly but surely driving nearly global increases in vapor pressure deficit, which challenge the ecophysiological function of plants in a variety of ways. Um, we're also seeing systematic and long-term changes in soil moisture, um, though there is a bit more spatial heterogeneity uh, with, this, with this map. Regardless of whether we want to call it a pulse or a press, some things are true. Uh, vapor pressure deficit is rising, and the droughts of the future are going to be hotter, more severe, and likely more frequent than the droughts of the past. Moreover, soil moisture and vapor pressure deficit are becoming decoupled in space and time, which is important because each of these drivers can affect plant function through unique mechanisms. Historically, it's been difficult to disentangle uh, the independent and interactive roles of soil moisture and VPD on plant function, but it's really important that we do so um, because the extent to which these variables are coordinated is changing. And in the big picture, you know, all of this matters for our ability to predict the future fate of the land carbon sink, which is probably a research challenge that has guided much of the work done by most of the people in this workshop over most of our careers. Um, it's also important for understanding the usefulness of so-called natural climate solutions as a climate mitigation tool. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest in the public and private sectors right now around uh, strategies like reforestation and altered forest management as uh, natural carbon capture uh, approaches. Um, however, I can tell you that the quantification protocols uh, used to assess the potential of these strategies right now do not at all consider the possibility that drought and other climate feedbacks um, will threaten the permanence of carbon stored in ecosystems. And this is a big problem. Uh, and then generally speaking, there's still a lot to learn about the role of plant physiology in governing the evolution and occurrence of drought writ large, for example, through land atmosphere interactions. So, you know, ecosystem and plant drought responses is a big field, and I'm not going to be able to cover all of the interesting aspects of this field of research today. Um, what I want to do is highlight three knowledge gaps or research opportunities um, that on the one hand guide my thinking on the topic, but also, as I alluded to earlier, could be confronted with better information about uh, water potential gradients. Uh, the first is the fact that plant water use strategies and tree mortality remain frustratingly difficult to categorize and predict. Uh, concepts like isohydry remain popular but also controversial, and there is a rich discussion in the literature about the extent to which we can and should create generalizable plant water use strategies, and then also the extent to which these uh, water use strategy frameworks are useful for predicting uh, the occurrence of tree mortality. As I mentioned once already, the role of soil water versus BPD stress remains difficult to disentangle. Um, there's been a lot of activity on this question in the past you know, five or six years or so, largely enabled um, by uh, models, but also continuous observations of land atmosphere fluxes, mostly from flux towers, but also from sap flux net. Uh, because these data are collected at such a high temporal frequency, it is possible to disentangle uh, VPD from soil moisture, which tend to be decoupled at timescales of hours and days. And then there's also been recently a real proliferation of hydraulic frameworks and ecosystem and earth system models. You know, historically, plant drought stress tended to be modeled with these sort of beta functions, these empirical stress factors, which tended to be hyperbolic in shape. Uh, but they didn't always work so well, so now we're experimenting with some new strategies focused on implementing plant hydraulic frameworks and doors to model optimization theory. Um, but there is a lot of work yet to be done uh, to uh, cross compare and validate these new but promising modeling schemes. Uh, so all of that brings me to uh, 
to, to this article, which was published uh, just the other week, um, titled Confronting the Water Potential Information Gap. And the premise of this paper is really that, you know, when we think about environmental drivers, precipitation, soil moisture, temperature, VPD, and so on, we have a lot of information at our disposal from weather station networks or remote sensing um, or reanalysis products. At the same time, when we think about ecosystem scale responses, carbon and water fluxes, we have again a lot of information available to us uh, from flux tower networks and sap flux net. We also have a growing collection of information on plant traits available through initiatives like TRI. What we are missing is aggregated information about the water potential gradients that uh, connect these drivers to these responses. And so I want to dig in a little bit here, um, but also offer some opportunities uh, to confront that particular information gap. So I want to start in the soils, where most of us um, probably know that water potential gradients are the fundamental drivers of soil water flows and elements contained therein. Uh, soil water potential shows up in Darcy's Law, it shows up in Richard's equation. Yet despite the fact that it is you know, a crucial soil hydrology variable, and we've known this for a century or two, we almost never measure it in situ. Uh, instead, we tend to measure volumetric soil moisture content, which is also an important variable, but it is not the same as soil water potential. Uh, there is a relationship between the two. It's called the water retention curve. Uh, it tends to be nonlinear and also uh, with, uh, quite heterogeneous from one location to the next. Um, the shape of the curve is determined by soil texture and also structure, such that at a given soil moisture content, you can have orders of magnitude variability in the soil water potential as you move from one soil to another. Okay. Sometimes we need estimates of soil water potential, and in the absence of direct observations, we really have two choices. One is to use uh, laboratory procedures to generate these curves um, on extracted uh, soil cores right, from the sites that we work in, uh, which is a, a good approach. Um, these are good data, and it's relatively easy to perform the measurements if you have the right equipment, though there are some biases associated with the physical extraction of the soil, and also it can be difficult to uh, create sampling strategies that really capture soil heterogeneity. Right? In the absence of lab-derived curves, well, you're probably going to be stuck using pedotransfer functions. Uh, which are empirical strategies for prescribing the parameters of these water retention models on the basis of a limited amount of information about the soil, usually percent sand, percent silt, uh, and bulk density. And I would guess that anybody that's worked with these pedotransfer functions in a very hands-on way knows that they are very sensitive and really uncertain. Um, so what you see here in panels B, C, and D in the shaded areas is the uncertainty driven by tweaking just one parameter of the Van Gnuchen water retention model within just one standard deviation of its reported range for a given soil type from a popular pedotransfer function. Okay, so we're talking about orders of magnitude scale uncertainty linked to relatively small tweaks in just one parameter of these models. And this uncertainty certainly propagates through uh, to our predictions for ecosystem carbon and water cycle fluxes. So this is a, a sensitivity analysis performed by uh, my collaborator Nina Raulut at LSCE, uh, where she explored the percentage of GPP variants that could be explained um, by variants in a really broad set of GPP model parameters using the Orchidae model. And what Nina found is that the water retention curve parameters, those shown in blue, explain an awful lot of the observed variance in GPP across three fairly uh, diverse flux net sites. Moreover, if we expand our view to include all of the soil hydrology parameters, uh, the percentage of the GPP variance explained uh, becomes even larger. Okay. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity here uh, to confront model uncertainty uh, with better information about uh, water retention. Um, you know, one promising strategy is actually to optimize the soil hydraulic parameters through model data assimilation, and there are a number of groups that are working on this. Um, but, you know, it would be nice, of course, to have some field observations against which to validate um, uh, the results. And then, you know, we can only uh, optimize so many parameters in a model, so we do this uh, at the risk of not being able to use model data assimilation to understand other model parameters. 
Uh, apart from modeling, you know, this information gap also impacts our ability to understand ecosystem job responses and conceptual and observational context. Um, so it is very common in our field to choose our favorites, carbon or water flux or conductance, and put it on the y-axis and then relate it to soil moisture content on the x-axis. And the resulting curves are usually nonlinear, often hyperbolic, sometimes sigmoidal, and they vary a lot from one site to the next. Uh, but it's important to understand that these relationships embed information about the water retention curve. And so the hypothesis that we could test if we had the right data is that simply switching out the x-axis variable from soil moisture content to soil water potential, which is arguably the more relevant driver, uh, could cause these relationships to become more linear and also more homogeneous in space. So there are some opportunities to make some progress uh, in the soils. Um, you know, measuring water potential in situ is still a bit challenging, but it is easier than it has been in decades past. And you can buy in situ magic water potential sensors for the same price as a volumetric soil moisture probe. Um, so we could consider targeted uh, focused opportunities to collect more in situ soil water potential data. We could also consider uh, uh, targeted opportunities to collect more lab-derived water retention curves. And towards that end, IU has a new partnership with Ameriflux, where we are expecting soils to be shipped to us from 40 or 50 different Ameriflux sites, so we can run the lab-derived curves and then return that information back to the community. Um, we can also imagine that there'd be quite a bit of value in developing new network databases that aggregate the existing information on in-situ and lab-derived soil water potential. Okay, next, I'm going to turn my attention to plant water potential, uh, which is a crucial variable for understanding plant ecophysiological function. And uh, ecophysiologists know this and have been measuring water potential uh, for decades. Uh, but the usual way is through uh, so-called pressure chamber measurements, uh, which are destructive measurements and can be quite labor intensive, particularly in tall forests where it's hard to access canopy leaves. As a result, uh, these observations are usually collected uh, at sampling frequencies of a week or a month or sometimes longer. Um, and critically, there is not yet a database or network that aggregates water potential time series. So while there is a ton of water potential data out there, by and large, it remains unnetworked and undiscoverable. If we had more discoverable networked and continuous observations of plant water potential, there are some important knowledge gaps that we could confront that have historically been difficult uh, to, to make headway on. Um, so I'm going to give a few examples. Um, one comes from this nice paper published last year, thinking about uh, ways to determine minimum water potential in plants, uh, which is a key trait, if you want to think of it that way, that interacts with information on xylem anatomy to determine the risk of hydraulic failure and tree mortality. And this paper shows that um, you know, our estimates of minimum water potential can vary quite a bit depending on whether we get them directly from data or through application of extreme value theory. Um, it's a promising path forward, but one that would definitely uh, benefit from more, let's say, validation data, um, for example, in a network context. Here's another paper that came out a couple of years ago. Um, this is really a modeling study seeking to understand how much of the variability in leaf water potential can be attributed to variation in soil water potential versus vapor pressure deficit. And what we find is that um, for most species, but it, particularly the more so-called isohydric ones, that the VPD contribution to variation in leaf water potential can be quite large. Um, but again, this was a modeling study, and at that time, and even now, we really lack the data necessary to confront hypotheses like these. I could go on, instead I'll have to point you to the paper uh, for some other, you know, interesting areas of, of opportunity. Uh, for example, thinking about pre-dawn disequilibrium uh, strategies for estimating rooting depth, and of course, model benchmarking and inner comparison. Again, we have some opportunity to make some headway. Um, we are really excited about the potential, pardon the pun, uh, linked to continuous observations of plant water potential, and in particular, stem water potential from psychometry. Psychometry is not a new technique, uh, but what is new is the commercial availability of psychometers for stem and leaf water potential. What you see here is a 
beautiful time series generated by uh, collaborator Jessica Guo from some creosote growing in Arizona. Um, she's aggregated the data from the psychrometers here to the daily time step, but even at this scale, you can see how rich these information are. Uh, this information is when compared to what we can glean from those discrete um, manual pressure chamber measurements. Inspired by Jessica, we decided to throw up some psychrometers in Morgan Monroe State Forest in central Indiana last summer. And I have to say that our time series are not as beautiful as Jessica's. Um, we had some issues with wounding responses and, and water getting in uh, to the sensors. Nonetheless, um, you know, we are typically able to get, you know, uh, three or five days of, of really good continuous observations after installing uh, the psychrometers, um, which alone can tell us a lot about the differences in the diurnal cycle of some water potential between species and ultimately as a function of meteorological conditions. Again, much could be gained from a strategic effort to aggregate existing water potential observations, be them discrete or continuous, uh, with the, particularly if we focus this activity on sites that collect other physiologically relevant variables, for example, uh, set flow or flux tower um, data or gas exchange data and so on. And uh, you know, a final point is that there are also promising opportunities for detecting plant water contents and plant water potential or canopy water potential from space using vegetation optical depth data. I'd point you to this nice paper by Alex Konings to learn more. Um, this is a strategy that would certainly better from more accessible ground truthing data. Um, and I just want to point out that you know this is a strategy not only for understanding water potential dynamics of the canopy, but to the extent that the canopy and soil are sometimes in equilibrium, this is also a tool for peaking below ground and understanding water potential uh, dynamics in the soil. So main messages, uh, we have substantial opportunity uh, to confront the water potential information gap by harnessing new technology with more to lab derived water retention curves uh, with observations of, of VOD and um, with the strategic and targeted effort to create a new network for soil and plant water potential. Um, you know, this, this particular workshop is not necessarily about building new networks, it's about manipulation experiments. So I do want to conclude with a few thoughts in that direction. Um, you know, there would be a lot of value uh, if thinking about, uh, let's say, quasi-intensive monitoring of water potential in both the soils and the plants, either through distributed manipulation experiments, or we can imagine some sort of super site where we really just go wild with the psychrometers and dielectric. Uh, instruments and, and the potentiometers and so on. Um, rainfall and fruitfall displacement experiments could be particularly good platforms for this area of inquiry. I have my doubts sometimes about how well uh, TDEs work in forests because we have one and it doesn't work so well, but I know that other groups have figured it out better than we have, so there's a rich opportunity there. And then, of course, I'd be happy to award some major bonus points that anybody can figure out how to do free air VPD elevation. Um, which to my knowledge has never been attempted, at least for, for a tall ecosystem. So with that, I'll end by again thanking uh, collaborators, um, including co-authors on the paper, but also a, a larger set of folks that have helped think about what a water potential network might look like. Um, thanks so much.